Um, I'm Katrina Williams. I'm the SAA student chapter vice chair for San Jose State. Um, and we are here with um, Kim Hayden. We're going to get a tour of the Center for Sacramento History. Um, and part of the reason we chose this, um, we asked Kim to come speak with us, is um, there's a lot of interest in um, local and community archives among our members. Um, so I wanted to ask you to share what local and community archives um, are you interested in, ones that you're familiar with. Um, go ahead and add to the chat any local or community archives that uh, you'd like to share with the group. Oh, that's awesome. Yay. Did everyone get those final assignments in? <laughs> My last one was due on Wednesday. Right. <laughs> like my whole life has changed that my homework is all in and the semester is over. <laughs> it's an amazing feeling. Oh, great. I'm glad that some of you are familiar with him and with the um, Center for Sacramento History. Uh, that's cool. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> cool. <laughs> <laughs> Little fan um, club for Kim. <laughs> we, we've been talking with one of the people here today about um, this this presentation who actually has a relative here um, hmm. who's a very important Sacramentan and I am wearing my shirt I made of him tonight. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> I'll talk about that later. I was going to say, I want to know the story behind that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm like, please share. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, we're pretty eager. I think we might as well go ahead and get started. I'm going to um, <laughs> go ahead and screen share for a minute um, just to go over some etiquette. Eh, that is not what I wanted to do. So thank you everyone. Um, this is a virtual tour of the Center for Sacramento History with Kim Hayden. Um, remember to preserve bandwidth by muting your mic and turning off your video, um, but feel free to ask questions, um, enter questions into the um, chat and we will do question and answer at the end of the presentation. Um, since Kim will be walking around and giving us a tour, you'll probably want to pin her as your speaker. So the three dots that are in the corner of her window will bring up a menu and then you'll have the chance to pin and then you'll see everything full size. Um, we are recording this presentation and it will be on our YouTube channel. So the Center for Sacramento History, it sounds like many of you are familiar with it, but it collects and preserves the cultural heritage of the Sacramento region and makes it accessible to researchers, documentary filmmakers, and the community. From uh, local news 
film clips and photographs to city records, furniture, and business signs. The center represents the city of Sacramento and beyond the region. Um, I had a chance to tour the Center for Sacramento History at the Archives Crawl um, back in October. And uh, it was just, it left a huge impression. Um, all of the little, um, all of the different things that are housed there. Um, that's an impressive facility. Kim uh, worked as a copy editor before um, earning her MLIS with a concentration in archival management from San Jose State. So she is an alumni as well as um, an archivist. After working as a library assistant with Stanford University Libraries and getting an internship at San Francisco History Center um, to get more processing experience, Satan was hired as a term project archivist at the Computer History Museum and she's now senior archivist for the Center um, for Sacramento History. So welcome, Kim. Thanks. I'm very excited to be here. Um, yeah, I'll just say that I am a San Jose State alum. When I started, there were still in-person classes, um, but I couldn't take them because I was working full time. So I never got any hands-on processing experience. And that really held me back from finding a job. It, um, it was like a couple years after I graduated, I just sought out what I called a post intern graduate internship. And um, I actually went back to the San Jose State intern listing and saw who might have a weekend internship available and found one and got to process a collection. And then very quickly after got my project um, archivist job. So that is to say, um, I understand the difficulty of finding a job. And if you want to get an internship and you live in the Sacramento area, email me. <laughs> um, we, I, there's another one of us, there's three archivists here. Um, another one's also a San Jose State alum who interned here and then we hired her. Um, and we both know the pain of not getting that hands-on experience and how important it is. So I um, am always happy to take interns or volunteers um, here, so to process collections. So anyway, um, so yeah, you got a rundown on me. So I'll just start talking about this place. Uh, I'm gonna turn my camera around so you can see it. Okay, that's not the most interesting area. Um, okay, well, anyway, we're huge. Um, this is one of two warehouses we have and we are the city and the county archives. So we were created in 1953, I think. And um, I don't know if we were created as the city and county ar archives, but we became them eventually by getting just gigantic transfers of um, county and city material. So we've got, um, we've got documents and records. This is an example of massive amount of county records. Um, We've got documents and records from the city and the county dating back to 1849 from pretty much every um, every department in both entities. And what's really cool is that we've got basically any government document related to the city and county that you might need. So we're really good for genealogists. We're really good for property researchers. Um, we've got property records dating back to 1849. We've got naturalization records from, um, yeah, from 1850 on to like the 1970s. So if your ancestor naturalized here, became a citizen here, we've got those papers because they were done at the county level for whatever reason at that time. And then, um, but beyond that, oh, wait, one more thing that's very cool about us and government documents is um, court records. So we've got court case files for all the courts in the county and the city back to 1849. And that is an amazing collection. We also have mug books that go along with them and jail registers. Um, so you can track the criminals in your family or if you're doing like social or um, race research on you know, crimes that were committed and who was prosecuted for crimes, that kind of stuff. It's just fascinating and just such a huge, huge collection. Um, I'm constantly told that we're one of the largest regional archives anywhere or something, I don't know, in California and the United States. Um, and yeah, we are, it's, it's huge collection. Um, <clears throat> so 
we also collect artifacts, as you can see. Um, this place started out, I think, okay, I'll just be real. It started out by like a hoarder, essentially, like a guy who was just a major collector. And he took just about anything. So, you know, we've got a bunch of chairs. Did they belong to someone in Sacramento? I don't know. You know, we've got this thing. Um, just like all sorts of artifacts. And we don't have a museum or an exhibit space. So these just hang out here. Um, we're hoping to get a new facility where we will have an exhibit space. Um, but yeah, for the time being, it just hangs out. So um, in addition to government records though, we collect personal papers. Um, that's Eleanor McClatchy. Have you ever heard of the McClatchy um, company, which ran the bee? Uh, she was the um, she was the president of the Bee forever, and she's a super prominent lady here in Sacramento. Was an advocate for Sacramento, and we've got her personal collection. She collected um, well, I'll just show you. She collected letter sheets and early maps of California. Um, she's got all these really cool maps of the gold fields that come with this little pocket that like the map folds up and goes in it and you put it in your pocket and go out to the gold fields. Um, and then she has uh, a large collection of 17th century maps that show California as an island. Um, so she just collected stuff like this. Um, she was really into printing and fine press in the theater. So we've got a lot of her collection on that type of thing. And then the Sacramento Bee is just like a huge, um, corporation here. And so we have their corporate files. We also have um, their photo morgue from the 1950s through like the 80s, or well, actually up until today, because they're starting to give us digital stuff too. So like all of these in this little bank here are full of Sacramento Bee photos, photos that ran in the bee. I'm just grabbing one at random. Hopefully it's cool. I don't know, a bunch of hippies doing something. Um, so that is like a huge resource that we have and we can monetize it because we can license it. Uh, we also license footage. We have, um, TCRA and KOVR, which are two of the news stations here. We have their film archives, which is millions of feet. And we are able to license that and create revenue, which is great for us. Um, and I should mention we are a city entity. so. Uh, the city, you know, wants us to make money and it's hard to make money when you're archives, um, but that's one way that we can. So we collect personal papers from um, individuals, families, organizations, businesses. We're trying to tell the whole story here of Sacramento. So we're, we're, we're a regional archive, not just a government archive. Um, this is an example of a messy aisle. So, you know, you saw the neat stuff. This is the not so neat stuff. Um, I mentioned we don't have exhibit space. Um, we do a lot of sharing on our social media, Facebook and Instagram and YouTube primarily. Um, this is stuff that doesn't have a place to go, by the way. Um, so yeah, we do a lot of uh, social media and try to get our collections out that way. The bikes, they're just bikes. You know, I don't know what the provenance is. <laughs> It's just one of those things. That chandelier, I believe, was in the Bank of America building somewhere downtown. Um, all of this stuff right here is from Sacramento Bee. When we recently, I know the chandelier is amazing. Uh, we recently went to the Bee in the last couple of years. They were moving out of their longtime building. And so we um, went and got a whole bunch of stuff from them, including this, which was a little trolley that ran around the printing uh, press and carried rolls of paper. It's very heavy. We almost regret getting it, but um, yeah. So yeah, we, I guess, yeah, we're regional archives. I don't know if I could call us like, you know, people talk about community archives a lot today and I'm never like fully sure if they mean like regional archives like we are or like more community where the community keeps their archives and we, help them with the process or the preservation. Um, you know, we don't do that. I don't think the city will even let us do that, like take on something without ownership. But um, we do try to work with the community a lot. Um, oh, right now I'm showing you a ship's wheel from the SS Sacramento steamship and some processing space. Um, 
yeah. So we try to work with the community and we're really trying to um, bring more diversity into our collection and into our outreach and programming, um, you know, so that the story isn't just the old white guys. So like right now we just are doing an exhibit with Hmong school children here in Sacramento who basically created an exhibit with us using their own artifacts, which was adorable. Um, and we've done preservation workshops and of course we do the archives crawl and we're doing, um, we've been doing a video series on the history of systemic racism in Sacramento, which actually brings me to my shirt. Um, so we uh, have been using our, the material in our collection to make these videos to just show people like, here's why things are how they are today. Here's, here's how it came about. Um, and the first one we did was on John Sutter and how horrible he was and just kind of trying to break that myth that he was this great businessman and this great leader when in fact he was just awful and abusive. And uh, then we did one on fair housing. And then the most recent one, uh, which we just published yesterday is about the KKK in Sacramento um, and their attempt to infiltrate the city government here um, by electing people and um, in 1922, so 100 years ago, KKK was here and they were trying to take over our government. And Clyde CV, the guy on my shirt, um, who is Sharon's great great grandpa, we found out um, he wrote a letter to city council. He lobbied city council to fire anyone in the city who was in the KKK. And as a city employee, so we're we are um, we're a city division. Um, I can't imagine like knowing that there were members of the KKK, but the KKK equivalent today is like the Proud Boys or, you know, the alt-right. And, you know, imagine knowing that there's those people and that the city manager is fighting to get, he basically said like, it's not possible to serve the city of Sacramento and have these beliefs because you can't, you can't, you can't serve everyone if you think some of them are unequal. unequal. So anyway, Clyde Seavey is a personal hero of ours here's it here at the center and we made a video about him recently so um okay so this is processing space um we don't have room anywhere in our front office for processing and actually I'll explain this giant cube this is our cold storage we just had it built um it has our film in it our nitrate and uh, nitrate photograph negatives. And then, oh no, sorry, those are in a freezer. <clears throat> it has our photographic, <coughs> pardon me, and film uh, negatives. And the, I guess I'll take you into it. It's really cold, but it's pretty neat. Um, so anyway, we used to have more space for uh, processing. We don't now, so now we just like shove tables wherever we can. And this is my little processing space and I'll show it to you in a second. But let's go into cold storage. <clears throat> it looks like the uh... Wi-Fi doesn't like cold storage. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> there we are. Okay, sorry, I guess that was like a dead zone. <laughs> well, it was terrible in there. It's 40 degrees in there. It's filled with film. I try not to go in there. <laughs> um, anyway, I'll show you our AV space because uh, we have all this film. We like to digitize it and we were able to get the funding for a very fancy film digitization machine, which is here. Um, I mean, I don't use it. I can't tell you how to use it. Um, yes, I have been very afraid of getting stuck in the cold storage many times because there's no handle on the out in the inside you just have to push the door but like your first thought is there's no handle um but anyway so this is our film uh processing lab where we do splices and clean stuff up and fix sprocket holes 
And then we do our digitization in here and we've got all these, you know, UMATIC and VHS recorders. Um, and then our film tech is the one who helps us make our uh, videos that we've been working on. And yes, we have a card catalog. That is the index to the KCRA um, film archives. And yeah, I'll show you my processing space. Uh, I am working on currently a collection of a company here called Historic Environment Consultants, which is a um, architectural preservation company. They go out and they survey buildings, districts for their uh, historic value and preservation value. And so this is my little space. I've got my piles. I'm doing my sorting. I hate slides. I came across some of them. They're the worst. Um, and then I said I would show an example of some unprocessed and processed boxes. So these are two of them that I'm working on right now. And this is how they came. <laughs> and this is pretty typical. Sometimes they're sort of in an order, you know, and then sometimes they're a pile. And you get to just go through the pile and see what you see. And then, you know, start sorting things like so. I use a lot of colored sticky notes. Um, and then they start to become an order. That's my working box. And then um, this is a finished box, which is just lovely and orderly. And uh, everything's got, you know, a folder, box and folder number. And yeah, we, um, I'm actually the first. MLIS to work here. And so the um, processing that was going on here before was um, done by people who have more of a museum or public history background. So a lot of it was done in weird ways. Um, so, and a lot of people didn't do, there just wasn't a lot of processing happening. So we have an incredible backlog and we're just trying to work through that right now. And that's why we like having volunteers and interns um, because we can't do all of it, but yeah, it's, um, it's a tremendous backlog. Uh, like I said at the beginning, this is one of our warehouses. We have a second one that is offsite um, on McClellan Air Base, the old McClellan Air Base, which is now Business Park. And it's about this size. So I think we have around 50,000 square feet um, we're getting a new one because that one has no um, environmental conditioning. And this building as well um, is pretty crappy. It can't, uh, it wasn't built to, to house this kind of stuff. You know, it was, it was built as a warehouse, but not to house historical documents and artifacts. And so it's not insulated properly. And the HVAC system can't handle cooling the space to the temperature we need. So actually this summer, um, as you all might know, Sacramento gets very hot. And we had a few days where it was like 115 and the um, HVAC quit. And it got over, it got 85 degrees in this room, which is terrible. And so we are trying to get a new building now. We're trying, we're working with the city and the county who also partially funds us to try to get a new building that has exhibit space, that's more centralized, like downtown, because, you know, we are, um, we're located kind of farther away than everyone else. We're located just north of downtown and be nice to be right downtown and, you know, have all that stuff. So we're working on that right now. Um, and yeah, uh, I'll show you guys the reading room. Would you like to see the reading room? <laughs> okay. So this is our office space. Um, we are open by appointment only. And uh, we don't, we have not had the appointments that we had before COVID. People just are not coming back, um, which is interesting. Uh, we ended up doing a lot of our reference uh, virtually. So we did a lot of uh, digitizing, like scanning stuff for people, which normally we wouldn't have done. Uh, but we found that it actually really worked for us. Like if someone just wanted to come look at a few documents, it's 
actually a lot easier to just scan those documents for them instead of making an appointment and have them come in. And, you know, if we don't have a reference appointment that day, that means we get to work on something else, you know, so it works out for everybody. So we've been doing that a lot more than I think we ever imagined we would. Um, so yeah, we have a little library. Um, I'd say one of our most used collection items are all these books right here, which are city directories. Um, they date back to 1850 and they're incredible. Um, they're my favorite thing. One of my favorite things here, I'll just pull one. They're really cool because they show you um, like not just who the, the person's name or like where they live, but it tells you she's a stenographer and typewriter. And this is, she works at Sacramento Bank and here's where she lives. So they're really cool for, um, for just trying to find like, what year is this? This is 1880, 1888. Um, they're so great for genealogy and just any kind of local research to see where people lived, what people did for a living. Like this guy is a horseshoer, you know, we love these. Um, and then later in the 20th century, you can do a reverse address lookup. So like if you have an address, you can look it up and see what was at that address. Um, okay, and this is one of our only exhibit spaces in our reading room. We have a little exhibit up um, for Archives Crawl, which is a collection of our restaurant pictures and associated menus. Um, so Archives Crawl is our biggest outreach thing that we do all year. Um, I am the head of it, and it's uh, a group of no, it's like two dozen archives. We get together and we have four site host sites, uh, us, the state library, state archives, and the public library. And we just open up our doors and other archives from the region table. And then we give tours and we have little exhibits and then we just invite people in to find out what we are and who we are and what we do. Um, and we have um, like a lot of museums and historical societies will ask to participate and we tell them no because they're not in archives <laughs> or a special collections library. And like, you know, we're like, you guys have, you have a museum, you have a history day, you have, you have all these ways that people know who you are and what you do. People don't know who we are and they don't know what we do. So we're very, um, we're very guarded with our archives crawl being specifically for and about archives. <laughs> <clears throat> so yeah, I think uh, that might be my spiel. Uh, yeah, what do you guys think? <laughs> that was very cool. <laughs> cool, great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, yeah, I loved enough? it. <laughs> okay. Are there questions? Yeah, I was gonna go back through and see if I missed any questions. Let's see. You know, I asked if that t-shirt's for sale that you're wearing. I know that's not. not like... I made one for myself. My oh, you did? Okay. <laughs> here, who's also obsessed with Clyde CD. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, multiple people were the like. The deal oh, here is that this is the, he was the very first city manager. And here he oh. looks like a total dork because he is the head whiskerino. Because in 1922, also the same year of the KKK here, they had this giant, celebration called Days of 49, which was a ridiculous, over the top, totally historically inaccurate, you know, let's celebrate 1849. And one of the things they did was all city uh, employees, men, were supposed to grow uh, a mustache or a beard. <laughs> and if they didn't, they were tried in a court um, and like fined five cents or something. I don't know. Whatever they were fined was raised to build this um, lodge for the Boy Scouts. So mm. anyway, this is, he was the head whiskerino. And so, yeah. <laughs> That's an amazing event. <laughs> it was, we're uh, mildly obsessed with it here. <laughs> it's super dorky. And like they built, um, they built a fake mining town uh, here in town. Anyone who knows Sacramento where the, the um, Amtrak station is, was an oh, empty yeah. lot. And mm -hmm. they built a fake mining town there. And they actually built a, uh, a mountain um, that you could take a mule up to the top of and a couple got married up there. <laughs> yeah, it was so just hokey and I hate living history and you know, all that stuff, but it's just like <laughs> sort of endearing now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Let's see. Yeah. Do you have a favorite item that you've encountered in the archive 
you know, that you're like, what? (laughs) Yeah. Um, there's actually a few things. Like I'd say the thing that made me go, what the most (laughs) was we have these tin types and I don't know where they are. So I can't show you, but they're this big. They're like the size of, um, a fingernail. They're so just like tiny, cute tin types. Um, but my most favorite thing here is our mug book collection. Oh, they, of course. yeah, they go back to 1864 <laughs> and I love them because they really show what, um, everyday people looked like, you know, like, especially in like the 1860s, 1870s, not everyone's getting their photo taken. Right. You know, you've got like rich people getting their photos taken, but the mug books show you what, like, you know, people who lived on the margins of society looked like. And the, um, the photos were actually taken in portrait studios. So they're actually like beautiful portraits. Huh. Um, and they're some of the only photos we have of Chinese from that time. And it's interesting oh. to see they're um, early on, they're wearing their more traditional dress. And then as the years go by, they start dressing more Western. And yeah, so it's like, it is really a lot of the only um, photos of people of color we have from that time period. Right. But I just love that they show one, what people, everyday people looked like, how they dressed. And then two, it shows um, how things haven't changed. You know, people talk about the good old days and, you know, things were simpler. And like the people that are getting arrested in 1880 are getting arrested for the same thing here. And the same people are getting arrested. So you see Mm -hmm. people of color getting arrested for vagrancy, which, you know, is code for Culture. being a color, mm-hmm. <laughs> hanging out where you shouldn't be, you know? So right. I find that really interesting. Um, people ask me that all the time, like, oh, what kind of, what kind of crimes are in there? It's like, it's the exact same crimes as today. People drunk, people stealing. There's just like more stagecoach stuff going on back then. <laughs> otherwise it's the same. And so I really like those as like a social document. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that'd be fascinating to be able to see those. Yeah, yeah, they're all online. They're on our. Um, I'll go check go, it out. Yeah. yeah, our internet archive page. Um, there's a there's a little collection of them. There's like I don't know, fifty of them or something. They're really wow. great. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and they're cool too. They go um, they go up to the 1940s, and um, some of them are themed. So some of them will be like um, Chinese, and it's all Chinese people, hmm. and. Some of the later ones, there's one um, called Degenerates, which is like sex crimes, mm-hmm. but also um, gay crimes, you know, crimes oh, like right. being gay, essentially. So, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, there's that kind of stuff. And then there's one that's all um, uh, IWW uh, union members oh. from like early 1920s, mm-hmm. um, which actually there was a researcher here going through that and he, he's been researching their arrests in the twenties. And he said, there's way more here in Sacramento than I've seen anywhere else from like 1922, 23. And I said, aha, that's when the KKK was Mm. here. And there were Mm. a whole bunch of clan members that were police. So (laughs) that's my personal theory is that there were a bunch of clan members arresting labor union members because they didn't like them. Right. (laughs) That's a good theory. It's a good theory. I think it it Mm -hmm. is. (laughs) Let's see. It looks like there's some questions coming in. Yeah. Let's see. Um, Sharon asked, do you have any information on the Donner Party? No, not really. Uh, we, oh, I should mention, we are very specifically Sacramento focused, right. city or county. So the only thing we would have from them would be their coming to Sutter's Fort after they were rescued. But I don't think we have anything. Oh, on that. interesting. Mm-hmm. And then there's somebody who has a question about, let's see, it's Sabrina, had a question about internships and volunteering. Yeah. Um, and she says, do you need to be able to receive academic credit to do an internship with the center? And no. if so, is there a preferred weekly time commitment? No, not at all. It's, okay. um, you can do whatever you want. Um, you can have it be part of your classes. You cannot. Um, we are able to offer some paid student assistance. Um, you have to be a student and you have to have a certain mm-hmm. number of credits, I think each semester. Um, but yeah, otherwise, no, you can, you can come in and um, we really like to tailor it to, whoa, what just happened? <laughs> that was weird. Oh my God. Okay. That was weird. You're back. <laughs> uh, I have it on a, um, a gimbal thing. Oh, I think the batteries are dying. Okay. I'll just take it out and hold my phone. Sorry. Hold on. No worries. <laughs> okay. <laughs> 
Oh, uh, I had it in a little folder. Okay. Anyway. Uh, so yeah, you could be whatever you want. You can just come in and volunteer and we can call it an internship. And, um, and I like to tailor it to whatever you want to get, you know, whatever type of, um, experience you want. Like, do you want experience processing, digitizing? We do a ton of digitization here. We've got, oh, I'll show you. Uh, we've got this, um, that we're very excited about. We got recently so that we can, um, digitize these like larger items. We have like, we have a whole wow. bunch of these, um, these are assessor map books hmm. that show property ownership and, um, yeah, so, you know, we've got a couple interns doing this right now. I have a couple people working with me doing processing. So we have all sorts of options. And, you know, it's really, you know, what we have a need for and then whatever you have a need for. We try to make it work. Sounds like great opportunities. And yeah, and she asked also if the, the way to apply, like, should they just email you? You could just email me. There's like on our website, we have a very, very old, terrible website. And it's, so it's kind of hard to, I can't even think of where the intern section is, but if you email me, I'll send you the link to the um, application. Perfect. Let's see. Um, let's see. You know, I had another question. I don't want to like dominate everything though if other people have questions, but I was wondering what it was like for you since you said you were the first MLIS, like what that was like for you coming into this archive because that seems overwhelming, honestly. Yeah. Well, uh, so there were archivists here. Okay. Um, they just were doing things. They weren't really, yeah. And they weren't really concentrating on processing. Okay. Um, one of them was a public history guy and he's great, but like he was concentrating more on the research end of things and less on the processing. So for me, I came in and I just started processing collections. Um, uh, yeah. And I was able to get quite a few done. And then those two archivists left about the same time. And then it was just me for about three months alone. And, uh, that was insane. And then we hired two more and then, you know, now we're full staffed. And so everyone is an MLIS and we all are on the same page about, you know, the proper way to do things and standards and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, when I came in, it was like, I only had these two years of project archivist experience uh, so I knew how to process and I didn't really know much about the rest of it. So I sort of right. deferred to them, but also was like, mm, that's kind of a weird way to do that. But <laughs> yeah. Is it pretty standardized at this point or? Um, um, it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. we. When I started here, we had like 10 finding aids on the OAC and now we have over a hundred. Oh, oh wow. And yeah. And so, yeah, we are, you know, using DACs and we have policies and a procedures manual and stuff. So mm -hmm. that didn't exist before. <laughs> uh, that, that was my other question. So when you have these digitized um, materials, what, where do you store them? What do you do with them? Yeah. So we, um, historically, they have used Past Perfect here, which is a museum software and kind of clunky. Mm -hmm. And um, we use archive space for our finding aids, but we don't have um, really a place for our photos and, you know, digitized mm -hmm. documents. We have content DM, but we don't use it because we realized after acquiring it that it can't handle the large number of um, files, like the mm -hmm. size for what we can afford, basically. Mm -hmm. I mean, it could handle it if we had a lot of money, but, you know, we don't. Um, <laughs> So we have, a, like, uh, with the city IT, we have just like a large um, special storage thing that we put them all in. And we use Internet Archive a lot for our digitized mm -hmm. stuff. That's that's mostly where we host it. So that's where you'll find all our digitized film, oral histories, maps. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we because it's free and it's public. We'd rather have our own thing, but it's just none of us are very like techie either. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like I like um, processing. <laughs> I don't like the digital stuff. So I can't even tell you like what the digital storage thing we have is called because I'm just like, mm -hmm. oh, I don't care. 
<laughs> don't have to worry about that. <laughs> that. I'm cool with that. <laughs> um, yeah. So there's that problem too, which I think a lot of us have. <laughs> mm-hmm. Let's see. Oh, there's another question that came in. It says, I was wondering how your pay, um, oh, do you feel like your pay is appropriate for the cost of living? Christine is asking that. Oh, I totally do. Yeah. I moved here from the Bay Area. Like I said, I'm I'm from Reading, but I was in the Bay Area for about 15 years. And then I came here five years ago. And so the Bay Area obviously is like insane and working as a project archivist there with no benefits. I was living paycheck to paycheck and it was awful. Mm. And when I moved here, I felt like I was a millionaire because it's so much (laughs) cheaper, like the rent. And now I have a mortgage that's cheap and it's just... Um, it's a different world. Now, if you were Uh, coming from like the Midwest, you probably wouldn't think that, you know, uh, but, um, I think our pay is pretty good. Um, they, our classification for archivist hasn't been updated since 1984. So in that regard, the pay is not great because the pay scale, it starts really low. And when they offered me this position, I was like, and and the salary they offered it, I said, no, I can't take that, you know? And so they ended up offering it to me near the top of the pay scale, which Mm -hmm. means that now I've been here five years. I don't get raises anymore. I get cost of living raises, you know, through the union um, agreements, but I've hit the top of the ladder and that's how it is with most people we hire because, you know, if you have experience, if you're just coming out of school or something, you don't have a lot of experience. Yeah. You might start lower, but if you have that experience, you end up starting toward the top and then you just like bottom out very quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's frustrating, but they are redoing a classification um, study right now to for the whole city. Good. So that should be changing soon. But I still think we get paid pretty well. Um, when I look at other jobs, like I'm, I'm happy with what I make. Mm-hmm. Let's see if we got any other questions. It doesn't look like we have any other questions in the chat. Does anybody else have anything they want to ask? You can speak up too. You don't always have to be in the chat if you don't want to. <laughs> I was just curious, uh, coming from San Francisco, going to Sacramento, that had to have been a little bit of a culture shock. Mm. No, because I grew up in Redding, <laughs> which <laughs> we don't know is two, two and a half hours north of Sacramento and is like kind of rural and um it's a small, you know, it's much smaller. When I was growing up, it was like 50,000 people. Mm -hmm. It's more than that now, but, and then I grew up outside of it in a town of like 1500. So San Francisco was a culture shock. Um, I (laughs) loved it. I loved it, but, um, I actually hated it too, because it was too many people. So when I moved here, my anxiety level like dropped massively. Um, it's, I will say it's less vibrant. Like there's less Mm -hmm. going on, you know, like, in the Bay area, there's just something all the time, but yeah. you know, I'm okay with that too. <laughs> I, I like it a lot, actually. Seems like Sacramento would be a good middle ground between this. It two. is. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I never wanted to live here growing up because it felt too close to home. Um, but mm-hmm. now I really like it. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> I live on a farm North of Sacramento. <laughs> mm. So like, that's how rural it can get here. <laughs> <laughs> I had a question about um, classes that you would recommend. I know you said you mm. did your LIS um, when they were in person, but as a you know, practicing archivist now, what would you recommend in terms of types of classes to take? I think the, like, okay, looking back when I think about it, and all of mine were online too. I just, um, I worked full time, so I couldn't take any of the in, um, in-person classes, but the ones I think were most important were the processing and the reference. Um, I know a lot of us are introverts, right. And don't necessarily want to talk to people that much. Um, you know, speaking for myself, I like to be way back in the back of that vault processing by myself. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And that's kind of the consensus here. (laughs) Um, so the reference class was so important and that was the only class that I didn't get an A in when I was in my MLIS (laughs) program (laughs) because it was hard and now Mm -hmm. I'm really good at reference and I enjoy it. 
I'd still rather not do it, but when I do it, I like it. Um, I just feel like that was an important one for me. And I think it is for a lot of other people. Oh yeah, Erin is asking a question. Are the users mostly local or do you have researchers coming from out of the area? Both, yeah. Um, we have researchers come from all over the world, actually. We just had someone here from New Zealand recently. And we've had, um, we get people from the East Coast a lot. Uh, I would say the majority are in California and probably in Northern California, but we do get a lot of researchers coming from afar. And, you know, especially oh. virtually now, like I just digitized 50 court cases for someone in um, New York. Yeah, over like a period of weeks, you know, we paid scanning fees and stuff, but yeah, we, we definitely help a lot of people. Um, we have so these, these court cases we have, they're just so important and we get a lot of people doing research with those. How that was often actually a do you find out? Oh, Go ahead. how often do you find out what they were working on? I always ask. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah. I mean, part, part of that is like when you're helping people with reference, um, you always want to ask what they're working on so that you better understand mm -hmm. how to help them, you know, like understanding what they need can mm -hmm. better help or what they need it for can help you like figure out how, what to, to give them. Cause it's not, I said, we have like around a hundred finding aids online, but we've got, you know, hundreds of more collections back there. So it's like every once in a while, someone is like, I want to see this box in this folder. But a lot of times it's like, I'm trying to learn more about this. And then you're racking your brain like, okay, well, we have this, 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 Mm -hmm. So I, I, yeah, I always ask people what they're doing their research on. And um, I often also ask them to like follow up with me and tell me how it went because I'm interested yeah. in it. Hmm. Um, the guy I just digitized all those court cases for New York is doing uh, research on 1860s and 70s Chinese women being held as prostitutes. And oh, he's wow. trying to find them by going through the court cases that are either habeas corpus cases or larceny because often or kidnapping uh, okay. but with the larceny he said um the women were considered property and so if they were like stolen like that would be a larceny case so he's been going through all these chinese larceny cases trying to pick out those and he's found a few but wow. yeah it's very interesting well we might have had another question hold on a second Okay, so this is coming from Tracy, and she says, I'm doing some temp admin jobs right now. Are there some jobs, positions that you suggest for getting related experience? Um, I think anything that's customer service and anything with databases. Because <clears throat> we do both of those things so much here. And like, you know, filing, just like having an understanding of very detailed work. Interesting. Um, are there languages besides English represented in the archive? Um, not a lot. There's some German, uh, there's some Spanish and Portuguese and that's, and a little bit of Chinese and some Japanese actually. So yes, there is, but not very much. <laughs> like it's like a tiny fraction. Okay, we have um, another question that says, are there any specific software that you would recommend that we learn? Yeah, Archive Space. Hmm. Yeah, it's open source. You can, um, I think, I don't know if you have to have a subscription to it, but there's the, what do they call it? The sandbox? There's some part of Archive Space where you can just go play around in it. And hmm. I would do that. It's really, it uses weird language like, um, like it calls resource, it calls uh, finding aids, resource records, and it calls different files, children and things like that. So it's kind of weird. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's not like super um, intuitive in that way, but it builds out finding aids as a tree, like you would build it out. And it's just a really, for me, I'm a visual learner and it's a really good visual way to see a finding aid. And then they have all these little sh shortcuts you can do to upload stuff with, um, uh, spreadsheets. So I don't know. I, I think archive space is like the number one one to know. And another question, do you lead outreach activities, public programming, or collaborate with other staff to find ways to engage users? 
We do. Yeah. So the archives crawl is like our number one thing. Um, we also table at community events a lot just to like get ourselves out there and let people know who we are and what we do. Mm-hmm. And um, our social media is like our probably our biggest outreach. None of us are big social media users, but it's like the only way we have to get out to people um, other than archives crawl, but that's just once a year. Mm-hmm. So yeah, we do. We, um, we collaborate together. Uh, we have an artifact uh, curatorial side here and we work with them a lot. We do like a speaker series usually every year where we have people come in and talk and um, we're talking about doing home movie day this year. So we try to do stuff to get people to get in here and see what we do. Mm-hmm. Any more questions, anyone? Thank you for answering all these questions. This is so helpful. <laughs> oh yeah, totally. <laughs> Oh, someone's asking for your email. <laughs> oh yeah, it's, um, it's khayden at cityofsacramento.org. And you can find that on our website in the like about us or contact us area somewhere. But, cool. Yeah, it's, yeah, first initial last name. Yeah, it looks like you'll be getting some emails. <laughs> cool, <yay. laughs> I have projects I need help on. <laughs> and also you can ask me questions if you don't like, want to come in and help, but yeah. I think it's so important to do this kind of thing, you know, like I know when I was in school and especially when we're doing these online programs, you feel kind of like alone Mm -hmm. and it's hard to get an internship. It's hard to volunteer and it just can be hard to connect and like talk to people who've done this. And I know I felt like totally in the weeds until I I started working at Stanford at the um, circulation desk, checking out books. And Mm -hmm. I met archivists who worked there. And I became really good friends with one and I just was able to pick her brain and, and she helped me like, you know, realize like, oh, you need to do this, you need to do that. And I just think it's really helpful to have those relationships. Mm-hmm. Well, we definitely appreciate it. Mm-hmm. Cool. <laughs> I'm happy to do it. <laughs> I'm happy to answer any other questions people would email or anything like that. Okay, great. Um, can I put your email in the chat? Oh yeah, sure. Oh, yeah. How long have you been working there, Kim? I've been here five years. Five years, okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Any um, last comments? Yeah, I have a quick comment. Kim, I wanna thank you so much for all the things that you did, finding that information on Clyde CV. My uncles were extremely excited. So thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. (laughs) It was very exciting to virtually meet you guys and talk to you guys about it. Yeah, it was, it was kismet. Yeah, totally. (laughs) You guys do great, great work there. So thank you so much. And this Ah, was a great, great uh, tour. So thank Thank you. you. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, you know, there is another question in the chat. Sorry, I missed that. So what other archivist work did you do previously? Oh, my only other archivist work like that I got paid for was um, project archivist. It was a two-year term at the Computer History Museum, and I was just processing, processing, Mm -hmm. processing, processing. And then when that term was up, they actually hired me for another two-year term to work on a specific project, but I took this job instead. Well, I did that Mm -hmm. for a little while, and then I took this this job because I actually really wanted to get out of the Bay Area Mm -hmm. and wanted something permanent, too. Sure. But yeah, those project archivist jobs, there, there's a lot out there, not a lot, but I mean, it seems like that's like all that's out there sometimes. <laughs> and it's frustrating because they don't have benefits sometimes mm-hmm. like mine didn't. And that's hard, but it is really good experience. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't discount them. They're frustrating, but. I, I had a quick question. You had mentioned that you were able to pick an archivist brain and they shared some advice with you. What's carried through that you thought was like the most important thing that they shared with you? I think really was that you need to get processing experience. And that was really the turning point for me getting a job. I mean, it was four years between getting my MLIS and getting my first archivist job. And I was able to get the the job at Stanford just because I had an MLIS. But I mean, that was like a low paying job at the checkout counter. It was fun, but like, it's not at all what I wanted to do. 
Mm-hmm. Um, I thought that was the most, the best advice. She also told me to get my um, art archivist certification, which I did, but I think that's like kind of pointless if you have an MLIS. I actually didn't. I, I Mine was up for renewal this year and I didn't renew it. And I actually have spoken on that at um, SCA <laughs> on a panel about it. I was the lone dissenter. <laughs> I think it's a little waste of time. If you have an MLIS, if you don't, sure. But if you have one, there's no reason. No one knows what it is. No one is impressed by it. In my opinion. <laughs> Where did you get your certification from, if you don't mind me asking? Sorry. It's the American Certified Archivist thing. And okay. they had a test. They do tests around in various places, like once a year. And mine was in San Francisco at the okay. Maritime Museum. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, once again, thank you to Kim for this excellent tour um but thank you everybody for coming and joining us and for all of your great questions and for keeping the conversation going thank you ali for host co-hosting with me um we have an end of semester hangout um on december 12th at 6 p.m so watch your email for that um and uh if anyone is interested in presenting or submitting a proposal for an saa um, poster uh, that deadline is tomorrow All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much, Kim. Yeah, thank you, guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.